The film Satan Tango is 439 minutes long, but if we remove the opening credits, the end credits, and the title cards that appear before each of the film's 12 chapters, 425 minutes of footage remain. Those 425 minutes are divided among 156 shots. This means that the average shot in Satan Tango is a little more than two and a half minutes long. The average shot in a contemporary Hollywood film is two and a half seconds. To make such a comparison is to imply a dissatisfaction with mainstream cinema and a wish for another experience of time in cinematic viewing where each shot offers more to be found in itself and in connection with the others. What is to be found in this, the first shot? At 7 minutes and 49 seconds, it is one of the longest shots in the film. It shows a herd of cattle gradually roaming out of a farm village without human supervision. Only later do we grasp something about the circumstances of this exodus, that this herd has served as a valuable asset for the villagers, who, in a state of economic desperation, have sold them off. Without this context, we as viewers must take whatever we find simply in watching these cows as themselves. In doing so, we see the value of these beings in their state of being. What value we find in such watching is facilitated by a lateral tracking movement. It is a technique used several times elsewhere in the film, especially in depicting the villagers as they, like these cattle, are set loose from the village that they have called home and are herded into an uncertain fate. Could one say that these lateral camera movements also perform a herding function upon these individuals, imposing a visual sense of order upon them? But there is a key difference between the cinematic order of the camera and the emerging social order within the film that leads the villagers to seek value outside all that they have ever known. The cinematic order of the camera reclaims the value of these beings that can be found simply in their state of being. Throughout the villagers' shifting states of unity and disunity, the camera mobilizes them in one direction. There are exceptions to this tendency, where camera movement connecting the characters isn't unidirectional. This six-minute shot that dances between nine different stationary points, creating momentary areas of attention within the setting. It is the same setting where the famous dance scene, the film's musical centerpiece, occurs moments later. In the shot on the left, it is the camera that dances, expressing all the nervous energy among the villagers that eventually is released in their dance.
Then there is this shot that spirals above the villagers as they are sleeping. And this shot that follows a bottle of liquor being passed among them. Both occur during the first day of the villagers' departure from their homes, as if to say that, in their newfound itinerancy, the rituals of sleeping and drinking are what hold their circle together. Speaking of alcohol, it appears in another pair of lateral tracking shots. They occur two hours apart from each other, but mirror each other almost exactly. However, the incessant ticking of a clock in the first shot is replaced by the sound of rain in the second. A life once contained by orders of time and ritual, now emptied and washed out. Another repetition involving alcohol, this time five hours and 22 minutes apart. Seen side by side, they seem to convey the unchanging condition of the doctor, deeply invested in his rituals, fatally embedded within them. Five hours and 38 minutes apart, the first and last appearance of Eremias, the instigator of the villagers' exodus. As he did at the start, in the end, he moves through an empty, desolate street, but with less rubbish and an additional accomplice. Do these differences suggest the new order and power he is bringing to bear? Whether in conveying difference or sameness, Repetition is one of the defining motifs of Set and Tango. With its famous use of recurring moments viewed from different perspectives and within the arcs of different character storylines. Putting these repetitive moments side by side reveals discrepancies. Are these discrepancies unintentional effects that mark the difficulties of maintaining continuity when filming a seven-hour feature film? Or can one ascribe these differences with a cinematic significance, if not an outright intention? Are these discrepancies between the shots meant to convey how different characters perceive time and space? Are they meant to reveal the gap between the external objective appearance of reality and internal subjective experience? And that even in the same shared moments, characters are tragically disconnected from each other by their own perceptions
This relationship between external and internal reality is also explored through the technique of the slow dolly movement. which creates a vertigo effect, drawing closer and further at the same time. We draw nearer to STK just as she prepares to leave the world. As Futaki daydreams about his future, we draw nearer to a window through which Nothing beyond it can be seen. We draw nearer to Mrs. Schmidt as the others talk about the imminent arrival of her former lover, Eremias, and the uncertain future that he brings. In these shots, there is a feeling of resistance to this forward progression, that drawing closer only brings us nearer to mystery and uncertainty. There is a similar feeling of resistance to progression in shots that follow characters as they move forward through the landscape such as these shots with a doctor walking in the rain. With authoritative characters like the doctor and Remias, their assertive forward movements are met with resistance expressed through the external environment. In these shots with the villagers, the hostile environment is portrayed less dramatically through the surroundings, placing more emphasis on the struggle of these bodies simply to move forward on their own. In this shot, the conflict is conveyed through Estique's facial expression, bearing a trauma so internalized that it cannot be shaken no matter how much she moves forward. In contrast to the turbulence of these shots of people moving forward through the landscape, there are static shots that frame the characters within a visual sense of enclosure. Compared to the agitation of the moving shots, the stasis and containment provide a mood of reprieve, however temporary. The characters' physical presences become foregrounded, expressing a poetics of bodies occupying spaces, briefly allowed to be themselves. <laughs> And then there are shots where faces themselves become landscapes to explore, upon which the camera lingers at length, far longer than most films. In each of these shots, the face of these dispossessed individuals is granted power to define the shot, the space upon which an entire world is built, but for a moment. But ultimately, this transcendent, ephemeral power of a face to establish a world is wielded most faithfully by one character. This close-up of Remias lasts less than 10 seconds one of the shortest shots in the film. The film's shortest shots are part of a scene filmed in the most conventional manner, a shot-counter-shot dialogue, the normal order of mainstream cinema. It is the only scene in the film that is shot this way. Perhaps it is no coincidence that in this scene, 
A police captain lectures Eremius about the value of order. Eremius silently listens as he becomes instrumentalized by the state. This close-up of Eremius lasts more than 10 minutes. It is the longest shot in the film. At the funeral of Estike, Eremius instrumentalizes her death to pass moral judgment upon the village and impose a new order upon them. He mirrors the captain's voice of authority but instead of the traditional order of shot reverse shot, Irimius speaks in one lengthy take. Throughout this shot, the camera tracks his every move, scrutinizing his performance for any false note. But like the villagers, the camera is held captive by his bravura oratory. His cries for decency and resolve successfully mask his criminal intentions. The cinema of bureaucracy is replaced by the cinema of autocracy. Eremius' words define the village and create the reality to which they and the film succumb. We see this as he dictates his report on the villagers for the authorities. As he spins his condemnatory report on the villagers, the camera spins as well. The spinning continues into a later scene when two bureaucrats sanitize his vulgar remarks for the official record. Through the temporal progression of these two scenes, we see a linear distribution of Eremius's words across time and space. Through the visual order of the camera, we see a circular movement of repetition and reinforcement. Is this progress or regress? The scene of the bureaucrats ends with their report on the villagers sitting in their darkened office, foretelling the end of the final scene of the film. Between these two scenes, there's one final doubling, depicting the act of writing as the preservation of times past, all the while entombed in darkness. For all of the 156 shots in Set and Tango, for all of their temporary formations and spectacular motions, and for all of the exceptional time they contain, it is this darkness to which we return. It is a darkness that leaves us to contemplate what to make of all the minutes that have already passed as they return to us once more in a darkness as endless as the cinema itself. <laughs>